Heavenly Father, we ask for your presence this morning as we take up this study. We ask that you'd pour your latter rain out upon us, that you would bless the production that we're doing here, that it might be effective um, technically, and that it might be a blessing to those that are listening, wherever they might be. We ask that you take control of the words and the thoughts, that they would be edifying for your, your people and glorifying and honor, honoring you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this chiasm up here, when we were discussing it a couple of days ago, <clears throat> we conjectured that if it had just been one day different, then it would add to 327. Okay, so there, in Theodore's study of calendars, and Odilio and Stephen and some others are following along, long time ago, Theodore brought in the Mayan calendar that the Mayan Indians used. And so that started that discussion up here where we were conjecturing, you know, if we missed one day, then it would add up to 327. It'd be speaking to the, the idea of 327. So there's been go an ongoing revelation of the Mayan calendar since that point in time. There's an email dialogue going on between a group of people. And I'm, I don't mind watching it and following it but it's difficult enough for me to internalize the Gregorian, uh, all, all the calendars that we're, we're dealing with now, the biblical calendar, the rabbinical calendar, Gregorian, what's the other one? Julian, Julian calendar, and line them up in, an, in a way to where I have a certain amount of confidence that I can teach it in a sim simple fashion for people to understand. So I'm telling you, I'm not even close to the point to where I would start inserting information about the Mayan calendar into this discussion that I'm doing. But the Mayan calendar is speaking, I'm telling you that they're finding things about this that may very well uphold some of these ideas. I can't explain it to you, but all I can do is tell you that I'm watching it, not that that matters, but it's, and it's, they're studying that out, but I'm not, I don't have the aptitude to teach it in a simple fashion, so I'm not going to try. Uh, pardon me? You don't know how you could, yeah. Uh, but it's some of the things that they're coming, that some of the things they're finding in this Mayan calendar are, are pretty profound. You know, that, like, you know, the, the day that it started in history, it has a starting point for that calendar, calendar was August 11th, stuff like that. Um, but, <clears throat> Okay, this, this is a continuation of the Kingdom of the Beast. And I think if everything goes well on Sabbath, I should be able to conclude this. Um, and on page one of your notes, and I have the, the title of this notes is Francis the Vile. Uh, that might be name calling, but Pope Francis, that's his, the name he selected and Daniel 11 calls him the vile, okay? Um, so from yesterday's presentation, from the quotations in the Spirit of Prophecy, from yesterday's presentation, where she's dealing with... Um, th that telephone was less important than this. When she was dealing with, with the Jesuits, I just cut some, some passages from that. I don't have references for it, but I want to remind us of these snippets from the Spirit of Prophecy that we read yesterday where Sister White's commenting on the Jesuits. It says, The order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel and scrupulous and powerful of all the champions of popery. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume was the fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable. Assassination was commendable. So when we read in the Jesuits' oath um, that they need to shed blood to reach the height of who they are, Sister White is in agreeing with that. When they served the interests of the church, under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into office of, offices of state, climbing up to 
be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. To give them greater power, a bull was issued reestablishing the Inquisition. To give who greater power? The Jesuits. So I want you to see that Sister White is connecting the Jesuits and the Inquisition, and then in the next paragraph in that passage she says, Such were the means which Rome had invoked to quench the light of the Reformation, to withdraw, withdraw from men the Bible, and to restore the ignorance and the superstition of the Dark Ages. And I'm saying the light of the Reformation is typifying the light of 9-11 that lightens the whole earth, and the the, the early histories, uh, sacred histories, are illustrating this history. Therefore, the means that Satan uses at the end will be the same means he used in the past. His primary tools will be the Jesuits and the Inquisition. Okay, we have a quote we often use, but we, I usually just take it from last day events and just get a couple sentences. But I went to the original manuscript to put some other thoughts in with it. It's a place where Sister White says there will be many martyrs. I'm trying to cement in that the Inquisition gets repeated. This is from 1888 Materials, page 484-485. The two armies will stand distinct and separate, and this distinction will be so marked that many who shall be convinced of truth will come on the side of God's commandment-keeping people. When this grand work is to take place in the battle, prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned, many will flee for their lives from cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense of the truth. I want to make point here, this kingdom of the beast in Daniel's last vision I'm saying that these ex external kingdoms, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, are speaking to parallel experiences in the internal of the kingdom of the 144,000. And I, I want to remind those that have been here following along sep since September 7th, there was an old, they're all the same age I guess, but there was a, a familiar passage from the Spirit of Prophecy that has been used in Adventism for years and years by many people that became really, after September 7th, we used it several times and it was speaking to the situation. And 20 years ago I had this quote memorized, I don't have it memorized anymore. It says, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when the champions are few. This will be our test. Um, we are together, strength from their cowardness, warmth from their coldness. Uh, it, that's the quote. Um, that's a paraphrase, of course. But that became relevant to us in September 9th when we realized what had happened. And what I'm saying is, as we're looking here at the martyrdom that takes place at the Sunday Law, the persecution from the Sunday Law to the close of probation, she's referencing many there will be many martyrs for Christ's sake in standing for the defense of the truth. Okay, To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. That's the big picture here, the persecution of the Sunday Law time period. But internally it's speaking back to um, the time period of September 7th. They will be brought before kings and rulers and before councils to meet. You're back, huh? They were scheduled. They will be brought before kings and rulers and before councils to make the false absurd and lying accusations brought against them, but they must stand firm as a rock to principle, and the promise is, as thy day, so shall thy strength be. You will not be tempted above that which you are able to bear. Jesus bore all this and far more. The express command of God must be obeyed, for God has been working. Luke 21, 8 through 19. <clears throat> An intelligent knowledge of His Word has been given to prepare men and women to contend zealously for the law of Jehovah, 
to reestablish the holy law, make up the breach that has been made in the law of God, and to restore the tables of stone to their ancient, exalted, honorable position. And God's faithful servants, when brought into straight places, should not confer with flesh and blood. There will be, even among us, hirelings and wolves in sheep's clothing who will persuade some of the flock of God to sacrifice unto other gods before the Lord. We have reason to know how Paul would act in any emergency. The love of God, the love of Christ, constraineth us. 2 Corinthians 5.13 youth, youth who are not established, rooted and grounded in the truth, will be corrupted and drawn away by the blind leaders of the blind and the ungodly, the, despiser, the despisers that wonder and perish, who despise the sovereignty of the ancient of days and place on the throne of false God, a being of their own defining, and being altogether such a one of them as themselves, these will be agents of Satan's hand to corrupt the faith of the unwary. Exactly now, what, they, what, what I'm saying is she's speaking to the history now of the Sunday law to the close of probation, and I'll, that's the kingdom of the beast, that's the external. And I'm just wanting to point out here for when we come back and apply these internally that this has already taken place internally in our movement. And we've seen much of this manifested. Continuing on, those who have been self-indulgent and ready to yield to pride and fashion and display will sneer at the conscientious, truth-loving, God-fearing people and will in this work sneer at the God of heaven himself. The Bible is disregarded the wisdom of men exalted, and Satan and the man of sin are worshipped by the wisdom of this age, while the angel is flying through the midst of heaven, crying, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. So in this time period, she also is referencing Islam. So when you bring that back internally, when this happens to us internally, August 29th, September 7th, November 9th, January 11th, in this history, in the backdrop of this shaking the separation, are the three woes. <laughs> Clearly, combining the first anguish message with the woes. Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay, so now on page two of your notes, I got Isaiah 23, where we were looking at yesterday, but we did not walk through it, and we need to walk through it um, really quickly. We commented on it. The burden of Tyre, verse 1, the prophecy of Tyre, Howl ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no entering in. From the land of Kittim it is revealed to them. From 9-11, from Carthage, from the symbolism of the second trumpet, this story is opened up. The second trumpet, Genseric, he takes control of the seas and wipes out the economy of the Roman Empire. Verse 2, Be still, ye inhabitants of the isle, thou whom the merchants of Zionim that pass over the sea have replenished. And by great waters the seed of Sior, the harvest of the river, is her revenue, and she is the mart of nations. Talking about the economic problems that begin at 9-11. And remember, in Psalms 48, when the east winds hit the ships of Tarshish, the pain comes as a woman in travail. It doesn't just stop at 9-11. It continues to where we are today, to where if you had containers, you could get oil for free. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Uh, verse 4, Be thou ashamed, O Zion, for the sea hath spoken, even the strength of the sea, saying, I travail not, nor bring forth ch children, neither do I nourish up young men, nor bring up virgins. As at the report concerning Egypt, so shall they be sorely pained at the report of Tyre. Pass ye over to Tarshish, how you inhabitants of the isles. Tarshish being a symbol of economics. Is this your joyous cities, whose antiquity is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. Who has taken counsel against Tyre, the crowning city, whose merchants are princes, whose traffickers are the honorable, honorable of the earth? A little bit later in this chapter, Tyre, you're going to see, is the papacy. 
And the papacy's princes are the global economists, the, the, the rich countries. Um, and they're the leaders of the earth, the honorable, okay? Verse 9, the Lord of hosts has purposed it to stain the pride of, pride of all glory and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. Pass through thy land as a river, O daughter of Tarshish, there is no more strength. He stretched out his hand over the sea, he shook the kingdoms, and the Lord hath given a commandment against the merchant city to destroy the strongholds thereof. The economy is coming down. And he said, Thou shalt no more rejoice, O thou oppressed virgin daughter of Zidon. Arise, pass over to Chittim. There also shalt thou have no rest. Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This people, who, who are the Chaldeans? Rome. The religious elite of Rome. Okay, Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This people was not till the Assyrian founded them. Who's the haughty Assyrian? It's the king of the north. It's Babylon. It's Rome. And he founded the, the kingdom of the Chaldeans. He founded it for them that dwell in the wilderness. They set up the towers. What's a tower? Church. A church. Thereof. They raised up the palaces. What's a palace? State. Okay, so when he founds the kingdom of Babylon, it's a, a kingdom that's based upon the combination of church and state. And he brought it to ruin. Howl ye ships of Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste, and it shall come to pass in that day. At what day? When the strength, the economy has been laid waste. And it shall come to pass when the economy has been laid waste. And what I would plug in there from the spirit of prophecy is the passage where Sister White says the people of this country are going to force their legislators to pass a Sunday law in order to return to temporal, return to temporal prosperity. So when you get to the point where the strength of Tarshish has been laid waste, and it shall come to pass in that day, that Tyre shall be forgotten seventy years according to the days of one king. And at the end of seventy years, Tyre shall sing as a harlot. Take an harp, go about the city, thou harlot that has been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs, that thou mayest be remembered. Okay. Although we've dealt with this several times, we should probably... I'll understand this already, but 1798, Manasseh. We can line the seven last Judean kings up with 1798 down to the Sunday law. That isn't usually how we do it. We usually line it up from 1798 to 1844, and then we'll line it up again from 1989 to the Sunday law. That's the beginning and end of this history, but you can do it from Manasseh to Zedekiah right here. It works three ways. Once in the beginning, once in the end, and you can lay the seven kings across the whole history of what is this history of? This is the history of the USA as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy, right? From 1798 to the Sunday Law. What else is it? It's the 70 years that she's forgotten. Manasseh means causing to forget. Down here, the Sunday Law. You're going to remember the Sabbath day. At the end of 70 years, she's going to be remembered. What else is this? This is the history of Babylon. Isn't it? Wasn't Bab didn't Babylon rule the world for 70 years? And this would be the history of, what else? Paganism. Yep. Why? Why? Well, the 2520. Foundation of Adventism, Daniel 8.13. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily desolation and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? That's a 2520, beginning in 723. 
and in the middle is 538. You have 1260 years that paganism is trampling down the sanctuary of the host, followed by what? 1260 papalism. Papalism. So, the history of the United States has been typified by what? The history of Babylon, the history of paganism from 723 to 538, and the history of papalism. Um, and, and there's one other history, maybe you're not familiar with it, I'm putting it in here, but what other history would you put in here? France? France? Maybe I'd ha I, I, you'd have to show me how, but Egypt. The 400 years of Egypt was where were God's people in captivity yes. here and here. Were they in captivity here? Okay, so these, these lines, in any case, this is the history that she's forgotten, Tyre. Here she's going to commit fornication with the kings of the earth. She's going to go about, this, <clears throat> go about the city and sing her songs. Um, and it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre and she shall, shall turn, her, turn to her hire and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And her merchandise and her hire shall be for holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. From the Sunday law to here, she's going to rule for how long? An hour. One hour. But it isn't going to be, it isn't going to be a walk in the park for her. This is, this is her judgment. She's getting judged here. She takes control of the world, but as she's taking control of the world, she's coming down. And her, what she thinks is her trophies are what is going to support God's work during that time period. Okay, it's, it's the nethanims that are coming out of this history that are going to sustain God's people. That's what this last verse is speaking about. So, even though she wins here, uh, and this is my argument, I, I could be... I could be wrong about this, but I'm saying, teaching, that from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, that this is World War III. But I'm saying that this history here, even though there's going to be warfare and bloodshed going on in a big time way, it's not really World War III. This is the time that the papacy takes control of the world and commits fornication with the kings of the earth. She immediately loses her kingdom, if you're thinking about the Catholic Church. She immediately gives her kingdom to Satan. Satan's going to take control of this church, and all of its structure is going to start getting taken apart. This is more like World War IV. It's different than this. Uh, but if you want to argue that the whole thing is World War III... Yeah, it's going to get bad. Okay, so what we're looking at here in this study now is the kingdom of the beast and Daniel's last vision. And she's not really illustrated in this history here so much. Her illustration comes here. But because of the external and internal of things, what goes on here is speaking to what went on back here in our history. Um, in the history of the 144,000. So that's, go to Revelation 17.4. I want to make sure that we understand these things. I don't... I don't think we understand the seriousness of where we're at. And, and here's what I'm saying. I'm not promoting Mormonism, okay? I'm not doing that. But a month and a half ago or so when this pandemic started, most people in the United States, when given opportunity, were going into the grocery stores and buying toilet paper and stocking up on food like the Mormons do by principle. The Mormons do that as part of their religion. Um, but what I'm sensing is, is that 
even though as Americans or around probably everywhere in the world people are doing that they're doing that because of this pandemic but the reality of it is if you know this message you should be doing it a hundred times more right now than you were because of the pandemic because you believe that on July 18th Nashville is going to get nuked and when Nashville gets nuked if you think the economics of this country are bad right now and the transportation lanes are bad right now and the food distribution is bad right now it's going to be nothing like then. This is like your last opportunity to stockpile the food and I don't think anyone's been doing it for that they've been doing it for I need to get through this pandemic until they open the doors okay so my point is this I don't think we're being serious enough about what's about to take place this is when sister white speaks about this history we're moving into she, she uses expressions like this no pen can describe the magnitude of this ordeal. She's saying it's impossible to be conveyed in human words how bad this is going to be. So uh, anyway, so in Revelation 17, 4, 14, 17, 14. Yeah. My good friend is Mormon, and you have to remember that about two years ago, they told all of the church members and everybody to instead of stockpiling food, they should be stockpiling guns and ammo. So at a church level, they're doing that as well. Yeah, it, it, that's always been the, joke. the frivolous joke about Mormons. You know, I don't need to stockpile food. The Mormons are stockpiling food. All I need to do is stockpile guns and I'll go take the food from them when it gets bad. Okay. But they woke up and they got the guns too, okay. Verse 14, these, these ten kings shall make war with the Lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The ten kings who also are going to burn the papacy with fire, they're going to make war with Christ. That's in this history from the Sunday law to the close of probation. Okay, because Revelation 17 says they're going to agree to give their kingdom to the beast. In this history, the ten kings from the Sunday law close of probation make war with the Lamb. Sister White says this in Selected Messages, Book 3, page 392. The so-called Christian world is to be the theater, theater of great and decisive actions. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved. Of this time, John the Revelator declares, the merchants of the earth, have you ever heard the argument in this prophetic message from people that are doubters or just opposed to it, that you guys talk about the Sunday law, but every nation, it's not going to impact every nation, it's not going to get into the Asia where they're not Christians and this, that and the other and here you have a pandemic going is every nation involved? Uh -huh. Okay, there's evidence that, that every nation can be brought into a crisis in ways that you don't think they can. And throughout the years there's been many people, I, I don't know how many, that have been born in different countries that have decided that they need to go back to that country because it'll be so much better than here. And when you realize even if we start, it's going to go throughout the whole world. No one's going to escape. That argument that uh, you know the Asians won't go along with this, <laughs> all that kind of nonsense, that's the very claim that, I hate to even mention his name, but I'll just say P. Yeah, made. Yep. What, what did he make? He was that there's no way a Sunday law would impact every country oh. in the world. Yeah. Every nation will be involved. Of this time, John the Revelator declares the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard the num another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. This is the Sunday law, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven. And God hath remembered her iniquities. Okay, there's the remembering at the Sunday Law. God's remembering her iniquities. She will be remembered when she commits fornication with the kings of the earth. 
Reward her even as she has rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. Why is she getting it doubled? Because of Revelation 6, the martyrs of the 1260 years are under the altar in Revelation 6, verses 9 to 11, saying, How long, O Lord God, holy to, will you not avenge our blood? Um, and they're told to rest in their graves for a little while until a number is made up like them. That's the number that's made up from the Sunday law to the close of probation. They get, she gets a double judgment for the Dark Ages and for this history. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. One of her characteristics um, in Daniel 11:14. Uh, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves. Okay, this exaltation is the characteristic of Francis the Vile. And live deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and I'm no widow, and I shall see no sorrow. These ten kings have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. In Psalm 83, where these ten kings are listed out, it says they have one heart. Okay, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with them are called and chosen and faithful. These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary, oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, as was manifested by the papacy when in the the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanists. What my point here is, is she's quoting Revelation 17, 14, where the ten kings make war with the Lamb, and she's saying the war isn't carried out uh, against Christ in the most holy place above, it's carried out against his followers on earth. Okay, so this is the Inquisition being restored. The two primary tools that Satan uses to shut down the light of the Protestant Reformation, which is the, which is the light of 9-11, because from Kittim, from 9-11, it's revealed unto them. 9-11 is the light that Satan seeks to destroy. And someone was telling me this morning that there's another presentation out there from P&T. Uh, wh who told me that? Facebook, I did. And what does it say? It says that they're saying that it's on the chat. W something like... It's not important. What is important about 9-11 in a derogatory fashion? They're just okay? throwing it away. Everyone that steps off this platform goes after 9-11 because that's where the light comes from. But Satan's two primary tools to shut down the light is the Jesuits and the Inquisition. Okay. Um, so, we're dealing with... The vile king, and, and you have in your notes Daniel 11, 21 and 22. We've put this in the record previously that these four Roman emperors in Daniel 11 are two witnesses to the, the history of the papacy from, from actually 1989 to the close of probation. Um, and the fourth one is the vile king, and that's Verses 21 and 22, it says, And in his, in his estate shall, a, shall stand up a vile person. What does it mean in Daniel 11 when someone stands up? Uriah Smith, the pioneers understood it, but Uriah Smith teaches it directly. When a, a, someone stands up in the book of Daniel, it means that's when they begin to rule. Okay, A power begins to rule when they stand up. To whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries, and with the arms of the flood shall be overflown before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. These two verses I'm going to repeat in these notes over and over again, and I'm going to highlight the characteristics from the verse that I want to deal with one at a time. He's going to um, obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Flattery... Hebrew 25, 19. 
something very smooth, what we would call in the modern world a smooth operator. Yeah. Okay, a, a, a con man, someone that's really smooth. It's, it's, it's curious that the Hebrew is, it really emphasizes that if you look at it. Something very smooth. That is a treacherous spot. Figur figuratively, blandishment. Flattery, slippery. So what does blandishment mean? You have the definition. Soft words, kind speeches, caresses, expressions of kindness, words or actions, expressions of affection or kindness, and tending to win the heart. Okay, smooth operator. But he is a vile person. This passage is saying the person's vile, but he obtains the kingdom with flatteries. This isn't an honest affection that he's putting out. Yes? This, remi <clears throat> this reminds me of Moses and Aaron. Moses speaks harsh. Mm -hmm. Direct. And Aaron yes. is this... He's wanting to please the people. Oh, good. Well, uh, sort of, but uh, Aaron's was a weakness in his character. This guy does it on purpose to achieve a goal. Okay, in... In Daniel 11.23, I'm arguing that part of his smoothness and his flatteries, his, the way that he deceives people, is expressed there. This is speaking of the papacy. The league we've identified in the past is the relationship between the United States and the papacy in the Ronald Reagan years applying it to the end of the world. Uh, it says, And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with the small people. He's going to establish himself with a small people. Okay? Liberation theology. I've been saying this, and I don't know if it has clicked for people, but liberation theology is what Ronald Reagan was dealing with when he was president, it, with Oliver North in Central America. Okay? And I'm saying that at that level, Ronald Reagan is typifying Trump. In this history, he's also dealing with the Pope that is a champion of liberation theology. So the def definition from Wikipedia is, liberation theology is a synthesis of Christian theology and socio-economic analysis based in far-left politics, particularly Marxism, that emphasizes social concern for the poor and political liberation for oppressed people. So not just the poor, the oppressed people. Homosexuals have been oppressed. Women have been oppressed. The poor have been oppressed. This is a theology that uses a small people to establish itself. In the 1950s and 60s, liberation theology was the political praxis of Latin America theologians such as Gustavo Guterres of Peru, Leonardo Boff of Brazil, Juan Luis Segundo of Uruguay, and Juan Sobrino of Spain, who popular, popularized the phrase, preferential options for the poor. I'm saying he becomes strong with the small people, is speaking to liberation theology, okay? Francis the Man of Sin, that's my subtitle. The next passage is from the New York Times. Six months after becoming the first Latin American pontiff, Pope Francis invited an octogenarian priest from Peru for a private chat at his Vatican residence. Not listed on the Pope's schedule, the September 2013 meeting with the priest Gustavo Guterres. Who's Gustavo Guterres? He's one of the founders of liberation theology in the 1950s. Meeting with the priest Gustavo Gutierrez soon became public and was just as quickly interpreted as a defining shift in the Roman Catholic Church. Notice the defining shift because the two previous popes were conservative popes and this Jesuit pope is a liberal pope and the world sees this distinction. They made a movie, the world did, about this distinction. Father Gutierrez is the founder of Liberation Theology, a founder of liberation theology, the Latin American movement embracing the poor and calling for social change, which conservatives once scorned as overtly Marxist, and the Vatican treated with hostility. In the past, the Vatican kicked out 
priests that were promoting liberation theology. Now, Father Gutierrez is a respected Vatican visitor, and his writings have been praised in the official Vatican newspaper. Francis has brought other Latin American priests back into favor, and often uses, uses languages about the poor that has echoes of liberation theology. And then came Saturday when throngs packed San Salvador for the beautification ceremony of the murdered Salvadorian Archbishop Oscar Romero, leaving him one step from sainthood. The first pope from the developing world, Francis has placed the poor at the center of his papacy. In doing so, he is directly engaging with a theological movement that once sharply divided Catholics and was distrusted by his predecessors, Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. So I'm saying all of these kingdoms in Daniel 11 have a conservative, liberal breakdown, and that in this regard, he's going to, this liberal Jesuit pope, first Jesuit pope, is going to become strong with the small people. This is speaking to this theory of liberation theology. He's going to use minority rights as he defines what minorities are to capture the world. And therefore, at that external level, the internal in this movement will manifest a similar expression, which it has done, okay, which it has done. We've seen that acted out with the PNT movement. Um, okay, quoting this verse again, it says, and in his estate, okay, this vile person that's going to become strong uh, with the small people through flatteries. He, he's in his estate. Okay? Where is his estate? So I'm going to... There's a passage in scriptures that nicely identifies his estate, the place where he is located. And in that passage in scripture, I have a couple quotes here from the Spirit of Prophecy where she's going to refer to that passage of scripture before we go look at it. So let me make some points out of this. This is Spirit of Prophecy. We exhort, exhort you to come up to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Shut out everything that will separate you from God. Put away sin from among you. The people of the world may seem to pass on without perplexity and to, move, to be more favored than the righteous. David says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. What's too painful for David? So why when, when the poor and the innocent are suffering, are the wicked and the rich prospering? Okay, David's, he's, he's in this dilemma. Okay, and then he says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. You know, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. There are many who are in the same condition of mind today as was David. But if they would go into the sanctuary and understand the latter end of the wicked, they will, would be no more envious of them. Where and when do you go into the sanctuary? at the midnight chiasm. Isn't that where the sanctuary is opened up? Is that where you see the latter end of the wicked? And you get reinvigorated from the, the, the pain of the separation when it comes into clarity what has actually happened? If they would go into the sanctuary and understand the latter end of the wicked, they would be no more envious of them. I hope no one was envying them, but now she's going to quote from a passage. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. Um, you ever wondered about uh, the magic carp carpet? Uh, the story, I think it was a, a, an Arab story about a, a magic carpet. The Prince of Persia. The Prince of Persia, okay. It's, it's a counterfeit expression of this passage from Scripture. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. 
The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Then he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stilleth shall be cut off, as on this side according to it, and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off, as on that side according to it. What is that? What, 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 there's two sides. Okay, so this, this flying roll. roll, okay, it's got a bottom side and a top side, evidently. And you're going to be cut off because of the curse on the top side, or you're going to be cut off because of the curse on the bottom side, right? And on the one side, it's, you're going to get cut off because you steal. And on the other side, you're going to get cut off because you sweareth. So, what's the two sides? On one side, it says, Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. Shall not swear. That's the first four commandments. On the other side, it says, Thou shalt not steal. Oh, that's the, that's the second. That, the carpet, not the carpet, the, the roll is the Ten Commandments. Okay? And it's a curse if you've broken either side, but you can't break one without breaking them all. And it's going through the world, okay? I will bring it forth, saith the Lord, and it shall enter into the houses of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of this house, and consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. This is the close of probation. He's, he's sending the Ten Commandments into the... Every home in the world, the cup is filling up. Okay, judgment. Now she goes back to her own writing. The angel is represented as flying through the midst of heaven with a roll in his hand, on which are written the deeds of our daily life. God bears long with the children of men, but there is a time coming when he shall cease to bear with them. So she's putting this in the context of the close of probation. God wants them to get under the cover of his wings. Jesus is pleading his blood in our behalf, but Satan is standing at his right hand, resisting every effort in our behalf. May God help us to humble our hearts before it shall be forever too late to make wrongs right. I have another quote from the Spirit of Prophecy where she's going to refer to the same passage from Scripture, but she puts it in a little bit different context. No man can make an offering to the Lord in righteousness until practical right doing is brought into the daily life. When does the Lord say that the offering of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto him as in former years? Pretty good question. When is the offering of Ju Judah pleasant unto the Lord? When, she answers it, he shall set as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. When does the Lord say that the offering of Judah in Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto him? When he cleanses the temple. Malachi 3. This is Malachi 3. Temple cleansing. But she's now going to quote the same passage that she quoted in the last scripture, Then I turned, writes Zechariah, and lifted up mine eyes, and looked, behold, a flying roll. This is the curse that goes forth over the whole face of the whole earth. So I'm saying, I'm claiming by these two passages, that the cup of probationary time fills up at the same time that the Lord cleanses the temple of its sacrilegious profanation in our history. When was that? August 29, 29th through September 7th through November 9th through January 11th. January 11th. Okay. So go to Zechariah 5. This is where she's quoting from. Zechariah chapter 5. And the, the first part of the passage is what she was reading. And in the end of verse 4, we've read, and what I'm saying is, this is speaking to when probationary time is closing up. It's speaking to the time period when the Lord cleanses His, his temple. And I'm saying that the temple He cleanses is this movement. Okay? You're a peculiar people that have been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. Verse 5. 
The end of verse 4, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Vengeance is mine. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what it is that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is, the re this is their resemblance through all the earth. First thing I want you to see there is he sees an ephah. You may not even know what an ephah is, but he sees an ephah, Zechariah, and then it says that this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. So there must be more than one ephah, because wherever this ephah is around the earth, they all look the same. You follow me? It's speaking of a specific ephah, but they have a resemblance around the whole world. Okay? Verse... Six. I'm going to read it again. And I said, what is it? And he said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, moreover, thi moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So you've got an ephah that looks the same all over the earth. And in the middle of that ephah is a woman. What's a woman? Church. A church. Okay. And he said, verse 8, this is wickedness. So he's, now he's saying this woman is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So he has this ephah, which, which is a basket. I'm, I wanted to save it, but it's a basket. He throws a wicked woman in it, and he puts a lead covering over it. Sister Kathy, when did he do that? When did he put a lead covering over it? Yes. Close, but not right. When was the... When was... Now you guess it now. Anyone else want to take a shot? 1798. Oh. She received a deadly wound. She's forgotten. Yeah. She's put, it, she's put it in the basket. She's, there's a lid put on the top of it. Right? Um, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast a weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women. Two other women now. What's a woman? Two churches. Two churches. And the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between earth and heaven. These two women are going to take this ephah that looks the same all over the earth, and they're going to lift it up between earth and heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? These two women that are taking the ephah, lifting it up to earth and heaven, where are they going to take it to? And he said unto me, To build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Okay, so I have some definitions for you. Wickedness, Great Controversy 356, you can read it on your own time. Ah, let me do ephah first. Ephah means measurement. Okay, the ephah is a measurement. Uh, but if you're going to measure out the flour, if you're going to get a cup of flour, the cup is the measurement, but you have to have that cup to get the flour. Okay, so implicit, is that the right word? In the understanding of the measurement, part of that understanding is that you have to have a basket, okay, that is that measurement, whatever it might be. That's a cup, okay, the basket is a cup. So this ephah is a measurement technically in the Hebrew, but even in some study Bibles, it talks about this ephah being a basket. Uh, in some Bibles, it'll be in the subtitles. So it's a basket, all right? Um, wickedness, Paul, def Paul defines, Sister White's comments on in 356, um, uh, cutting into the middle of that paragraph, it says, the man of sin, which is also styled the mystery of iniquity, the son of perdition, and that wicked represents the papacy. So who is this woman that is wickedness that's thrown into this basket. Papacy. It's a papacy. Okay, now what we're studying, but what we're studying is that he's going to be established in his own estate. 
in his estate, right? Let me back up here. Verse 21 of Daniel 11. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person. His estate is his place, his point of where he rules from. Rome. A stork. If you go to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 19, a stork is an unclean bird. And these two women have the wings of a stork. These are not pure churches. They're women, they're churches, but they're impure churches. Two impure churches are going to lift the papacy up and establish it in his estate in Shinar. What's Shinar? It's Babylon. Where is spiritual Babylon? It's in the Vatican. The Vatican is spiritual Babylon. This wicked church gets established at the end of the world by two impure women, two unclean birds. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 451. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism is apostate Protestantism a stork? Yeah. Yes. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf, grass, gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with spiritualism. Is spiritualism a church? Is it a woman? Is it a religion? Yes. Is it a pure religion? No. It's a stork. Apostate Protestantism and spiritualism are going to the dragon and the false prophet are going to come into a threefold union with the papacy, and the papacy is going to be the one that ascends. And ascend is the key word. Threefold union. I'm saying these two storks are apostate Protestantism and spiritualism that are going to place the papacy between heaven and earth, and place her in Babylon. And modern Babylon is what? It's a threefold union between Catholicism, spiritualism, and apostate Protestantism. Sunday law, this takes place right there. They're going to restore the lost ascendancy. Okay? You can ascend between heaven and earth. This is Review and Herald, June 15, 1897. This subject is urging itself upon my mind. Consider it, for it is a matter of vast importance. With which of these two classes shall we identify our interests? Read the fourth chapter of Malachi and think about it seriously. Okay, before we finish that, drop down. July 18th, 2020. This is the fourth chapter of Malachi. It says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all the do wickedly shall be stubble. And that day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, typically, in Adventism, we say that's the second coming or it's the destruction at the end of the thousand years. Okay? But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this. So you're actually walking on earth in the day that he burns them up. Okay, this, this isn't the second coming. This isn't the end of the thousand years. This is something that takes place before that history. Saith the Lord of hosts, Remember ye the law of Moses my service, servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the, coming of the, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In this context, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is when he burns up the proud and the wicked and turns them into ashes that the righteous are going to walk upon. That is this illustration of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And before that happens, he sends him Elijah the prophet. And what does Elijah the prophet do? He first lets the prophets of Baal and the priest of the grove set forth their offering, November 9th. And then Elijah sets forth his offering, which is July 18th. And July 18th is where the fire turns them into ashes. And before that day, 
Elijah the prophet comes. Okay? And Elijah, the last verse there, and what is the last verse? It's verse 6 of Malachi 4. It's 46. 46 being a symbol of the temple. This last verse is speaking about the temple where the priests and the Levites get joined. For it says, And he shall turn the, hearts, the heart of the fathers to the children. Where do all of us come from? Uh, Adventism. We're the children of Adventism. Where are the Levites going to come from? From our fathers. And the heart of the children to the fathers, to their fathers. There's going to be a bonding between priests and Levites, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse in this history. So it's a dual. Yes. So, back to the quote about the lost ascendancy. Read the fourth chapter of Malachi and think about it seriously. The day of God is right upon us. The world has converted the church. Both are in harmony and are acting on short-sighted policy. Protestants will work with the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin. These two storks are going to lift the ephah with wickedness in it up between heaven and earth. It is going to ascend. It's, but its ascension is caused by these two storks. That's what she's saying. Protestants will restore the lost ascendancy. When did he lose it? When the lead was put upon the mouth of the basket in 1798. When did they restore it? When she is remembered at the end of 70 years. Genesis 15. Oh, by the way, in that passage she also references... Psalms 119-126. I need to read it. Both are in harmony and acting on short-sighted policy. Protestants will work upon the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the state. That this national apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. The protest of Bible truth will no longer will be no longer tolerated by those who have not made the law of God their rule of life. Then will the voice be heard from the graves of the martyrs represented by the souls that John saw slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus which they held when where do we find that? Revelation 6, verse 9 through 11. How long till you judge the papacy for murdering us during the Dark Ages? Rest a little while in your graves until a second group that's going to die just like you died. And white robes are given to them. White robes, a symbol of what? Martyrdom. Okay, the martyrdom in this history. When does this take place? At the threefold union. When the apostate Protestantism and spiritualism restores the lost ascendancy. And then it goes on to say, then the prayer will ascend from every true child of God. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. When do they make void thy law? At the Sunday law. He works then. That's the external of the kingdom of the beast. When we apply that to the internal of the 144,000, when did they make void his law? On August 29th, 2019, they said, this is our visual test. Forget the health message, which includes dress reform. The sisters must put on pants or they receive the mark of the beast. Okay, they've made void their law. Now it's time for God to work internally in this movement. Okay, we read Malachi 4. Here's another passage about restoring the lost ascendancy. And here she's going to refer to Genesis 15. The land that has been abundantly blessed of God is fast filling up the cup of its iniquity. Remember, this flying roll takes place when the cup of iniquity is being full, full, filled up for all mankind. The figures on the side of iniquity are rapidly reaching the sum of corruption which was reached by the Amorites. Where do we find the cup of iniquity of the Amorites being referenced? Genesis 15 prophecy that was fulfilled in the time of Moses. The history of the first covenant people is speaking to the history of the final covenant people, the 144,000. 
dropping down to, well, i got to read it. Once the elect people of God. In the days of Christ, they made void the law of God, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, and this led them to reject the Son of God. When the people accept and exalt a spurious Sabbath and turn souls away from obedience and loyalty to God, they will reach a point that was reached by the people in the days of Christ. Oh, if the world could only know this perilous fact and turn away from the course which they are pursuing. How short-sighted is the policy is, that is being brought in by the rulers in the land to restore to the man of sin his lost ascendancy, to lift him up between heaven and earth. They are manifesting wonderful zeal in taking this spurious Sabbath under the care and protection of the legislators, legislatures, but they know not what they are doing. They are placing upon a false Sabbath divine honors, and when this is fully done, persecution will break forth upon those who observed the Sabbath that God gave in Eden at the memorial of His creative power. Then the commandment of man will be clothed with sacred garments and will be pronounced holy. Any fallacy is likely to be received by a people who make void the law of God. There is a crisis just ahead. Now, the law of God is made void there. Internally, when was the law of God made void? August 29th through September 7th in that history, in that 10-day period. So she's saying, any fallacy will be received by those people that accept that theology and that history internally. From that point on, whatever PNT are teaching, you've watched it. These people just drink it in. Okay, the Jesuits are good. The Jesuits are open. They just drink it in and accept it in spite of what they've known formally as Seventh-day Adventists. Okay, that's the external that I'm wanting you to see speaking to the internal. Any fallacy is likely to be received by people who make void the law of God. There is a crisis just ahead of those who are acting on short-sighted policy. The rulers of the land will take their position of the, of the great creator of the world. The claims of the false Sabbath will be brought to the front. And the rulers and the people will act upon the principle of short-sighted policy. The false Sabbath, the first day of the week, will be accepted and the rulers will unite with the man of sin to restore his lost ascendancy. Laws enforcing the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath will bring about a national apostasy from the principles of Republican upon which this government has been founded. Republicanism upon which the government has been founded. The religion of the papacy will be accepted by the rulers and the law of God will be made void. When the fifth seal was opened, when was the fifth seal opened? It's opened in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. This is the souls of the altars that were, of those that were slain that are under the altar, crying out for God to revenge himself upon the papacy. When the fifth seal was opened, John the Revelator in vision saw beneath the altar the company that were slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. After this came the scenes described in the 18th of Revelation, when those who are faithful and true are called out of Babylon, then she quotes Revelation 18, 1 through 5. And in verse 4 of Revelation 18, it says, Come out of her, my people. That is the Sunday law. And what's verse 5 and 6 speak to? Double under her, double. It's tying in Revelation 6, 9, 11 with her punishment because her cup is full. Okay, um... Uh, let me just do one more thought, because it's the same thought. I'm saying in his estate, this vile person, I'm saying his estate is Shinar in the terms of Zechariah 5. It's spiritual Babylon. Protestantism, spiritualism, threefold union, going to place the papacy in the throne of the earth. In his estate shall stand up a vile person. And in Daniel 38 and 39, it speaks about an estate. It says, but in his estate shall he honor a God of forces. And the God of forces, that word forces, means fortresses. And the goddess of fortresses was Samarimus. And her crown was shaped like a fortress. She also had many breasts because she was the mother of all. Okay, she's the money-breasted fortress goddess, uh, the mother of all, even known as Mother Earth. 
Okay? And in his estate shall he honor the God of for forces, and a God whom his father knew not shall he honor with gold. Not gold. Now, the Catholic Church knows the Virgin Mary, but this vile pope is going to take it a step further, and he's going to insist that the Vir Virgin Mary is also Mother Earth, because this is part of his agenda to take the world captive by flatteries. Okay? Um, Thus shall he do in most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide for land for gain. Now, this is, some of this is, we've already put in a record, this is from Wikipedia. It was on 22nd April 2009 that the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution declaring 22nd April as, what is the date? It's Earth Day today. It's Earth Day today. Boy, is that timing or what? No. It's, okay. the 50th of Earth Day. it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day today. Okay, the assembly adopted a resolution declaring 22nd April as the International Mother Earth Day. In so doing, member states agreed that the Earth and its ecosystems are our common home, and that it was necessary to promote harmony with nature in order to arrive at the right balance among the economic, social, and environmental needs of present and future generations. Underlying the resolution was the conviction that the earth was indeed mother, sustaining and nurturing all the species, including humans, animals, and plants. Furthermore, the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development 2012, entitled The Future We Want, reiterated, we rec recognize that planet earth and its ecosystems are a home and that Mother Earth is a common expression in a number of countries and regions and we note that some countries recognize the rights of nature in the context of their promotion of sustainable development. There are similar, similar goddesses in other parts of the world. One of them is Pachamama, the Andean Mother Earth. She provides harvest of potatoes and coca leaves. Today, environmental problems stem from the lack of respect for Pachamama. We take too much from her and pollute her, endangering the life of the planet as a whole. As South America embraced Christianity, the goddess Pachamama merged into the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary also began to be looked upon as Mother Earth. The modern name for Mother Earth is Pangea. The word is derived from Pan, Angea, which means Mother Earth. The name Pangea is derived from the e ancient Greek Pan, meaning all or entire world, and Gaia, Mother Earth. So, in his estate, as he takes the world captive through a small people, through liberation theology, he's also going to accelerate the worship of Mother Earth, which is Pangea. And we'll, 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 go, we'll continue on in this study. Is this Wednesday? Yes. On Sabbath. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, not that I understand the significance, but it's always amazing how you providentially lead us uh, into certain areas, not knowing that it was Mother Earth Day today until here and now. We realize that this worship of Mother Earth is only going to escalate through this papacy, through um, Francis, as he seeks the avenue to bring the world under Sunday legislation. We realize that his agenda of using the poor, a small people, to take power is fully underway, and we see these characteristics in the internal, in what has went on uh, with the Omega uh, movement that has separated. We ask that as we part ways here, that the reality that Satan used Jesuits and the Inquisition to shut out the light of the Protestant Reformation is speaking to us that here at the end we should expect to see the influence of Jesuitism uh, in the very time period where we have the first Jesuit Pope and we should expect uh, that the persecutions of the past are going to be repeated in the near future and we should with sanctified discernment see that these truths about the Sunday Law um, 
are fulfilled internally in our history of this movement uh, beginning uh, in September of 2019. Give us the wisdom to see these things and uh, rightly divide the word and take our position upon the wall because the crisis is about to hit in blinding speed. We thank you for these things. Ask a blessing upon our day's endeavors uh, that they might be fruitful and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.